Let us pray. God, as we gather this afternoon in the name of your Son, we thank you that he is here. Open our hearts and minds to him, to his presence. Work in us that which you desire. And so we do say, O Lord, because we are hungry for you, that you would speak to us, that in word, sacrament, song, prayer, Jesus may be exalted and lifted up and all drawn to him. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As you know, it's almost like half my job. I travel from church to church and confirm. And people make pretty audacious promises at these confirmation services. They are vast and weighty and well nigh impossible. So if anybody who makes those promises actually think that they can just do it, they are woefully mistaken. And God has this wonderful and occasionally terrifying habit of putting us in places where we feel way over our heads, where we have to depend on him. Because if he doesn't come through, it's just not going to work out. And so wisely, the crafter of that confirmation service, when the questions are answered, puts in the mouth of the responders, I will, with God's help. Read. When I think of this, that's what comes to mind for me. I will with God's help. (laughs) Saturday, just yesterday, I was at a gathering of youth from the diocese, all over the diocese, who had gathered uh, at Camp Wingman. The theme was prayer, and I was there, and it was wonderful. I mean, raw, honest conversation, great prayer ministry that happened. It was was earthy in all of the best ways, and I was so grateful that people were willing to step up and enter into that kind of genuinely transparent conversation. As I said, somebody standing out there, you know, if they, all they wanted was an entertainer, they could have hired somebody a lot better than me. But what happened was, is that God began to move and act. And in a way that I found, even in the weariness of driving down there and the other things that had gone on, just incredibly stimulating and refreshing. And just as we were getting ready to get to the closing communion service, a woman by the name of Deacon Pat came up to me. Now, Deacon Pat has been a deacon for well nigh 40 years. She's in her 80s, and she is the youth minister at St. John the Baptist in Orlando, and let me tell you, I wouldn't put anybody beside her in terms of passion, talent, and genuine heartfelt love for the people that she serves. She is She's tough, too. She lives in a neighborhood that has been through a lot of transitions, and she has stood down drug dealers. You do not want to mess with Deacon Pat. And she walked up to me just as we were beginning, and she had something crumpled in her hand. And she she didn't want to show me what it was. And she waited for me to open up my hand, and she just sort of put it in there and closed my fist over it so that I wouldn't see at all what it was that she was passing my way. See, with Pat, it really could have been anything. It could actually have been a lizard, for all I knew. (laughs) But it wasn't moving inside of my head. So I slipped it into my pocket, and we began the service together. Well, what she gave me was a wristband. And the wristband says, I am second, meaning submitted to Jesus Christ. I read if there's anything I want to say to you, my dear brother, it is you are second. Peter makes it very, very clear as he's writing to people who are in ministry, 
And he says, speaking to them, shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, not being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock so that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. You are second. Jesus is the chief shepherd. We are, in essence, the under-shepherds brought into this calling by God to live a life of transparent vulnerability. It is not an exaggeration to say that you step into this office with a certain level of fear and trembling because it feels at times like a tightrope. On the one hand, you love God. He's the one who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You owe him your very life. And there's no mistake about the fact that if there's anything that good that comes out of this sinful, broken person that you are, it is actually to the glory of God and not at all an attribute to talent, to education, to social connectedness, to the social abilities that you have to be able to mix with people. All of those are talents worthy of pursuing. But in the end, if they're not touched and even transformed, not merely touched, by the love of Christ, you just come across as a smooth operator, not a servant of Jesus. So to live as a servant of Jesus, especially in a culture that actually admires smooth operators who, quote unquote, just know how to get things done. You understand, don't you? Nod your head. We know people like that. They're the ones that get the promotions more often than not, at least out there, and because we do need in this culture people who know how to deal with all of the rules and regulations and the people and the things that you have to do, which only gets increasingly more complex, not less. But when it comes to the house of God, while some of those gifts and attributes are certainly helpful, they can mitigate against any level of humility that makes it first and foremost in your life to be able to both remind yourself that who are you? You are second. You are second. And therefore, to live a life under the obedience of the Holy Spirit, with all of the demands that are coming your way, knowing that you wrestle with the same kinds of fears and insecurities and demands that occasionally feel overwhelming is even your top executives, as well as everybody else. In the midst of all of that, what does it take? This is why the first lesson, only be strong and courageous. That was God's word to Joshua before he took on the leadership of Israel and taking them into the promised land and the fighting the battles that came upon that small, small nation whom God had chosen to literally occupy a place in history that would never be taken away from them. To be strong and to be courageous in this responsibility means having the humility to shut the door, to go into your own room, and to be before God transparently naked and say, if I have any strength at all, God, it's got to come from you. In other words, strength and courage is is what is procured in the secret place when you shut the door and there's nobody there either to praise you or blame you because both's an everyday occurrence, more or less, and to be still before the presence of God in such a way that God begins to pour his power and his grace and his mercy that is far beyond anything you could ever create for yourself. God help you if you tried. So that out of that strength, he begins to move and to operate in a way that takes a congregation, not just 
through business as usual. I hope that's not how you lead, Reed. I think probably not. But that actually so that there would be breakthroughs. Because you see, breakthroughs are things that only the Holy Spirit can create. Whether that happens in an individual who's been a Christian for ages, but all of a sudden it still doesn't look like in their life, and they know it, that where they are in the description that is left for us in the epistle where we're talked about living a life that looks like Jesus. I might look like a Christian that I admire, but I will tell you, I don't necessarily look like Jesus. And there's a hunger in me to step more deeply into this walk that I am just still trying to figure out. And when the Holy Spirit comes and brings a breakthrough, what happens is that somebody goes from here to here in a way that only the Holy Spirit could engineer. Change happens inside of an individual that can only be the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work. When that begins to happen, that's the fruit of a level of humility and openness in the congregation led by their rector in such a way as that we're willing to admit we don't get it right. And more often than not, our desire to look as the smooth operator actually gets in the way of our willingness to bend the knee before Jesus. And so, because we're so captivated by that kind of smooth operator idol, we need God to come in and literally dethrone that thing that we want to be so very badly because we have this big need to be liked and needed that almost never goes away no matter how old you get, by the way. And instead that Jesus might come in and work what he wants to do through us. That is always more than just making sure the car works as it gets its way down the road. That's the fruit of leadership and ministry with a congregation that often doesn't even know that breakthrough is possible that they, you know, get along and do the best they can with what they have. They're, they're good citizens, and they do the best to, to care for their families and to be responsible in their community and in their jobs. They don't have too bad of a traffic record in their lives. They've never been seriously arrested for too much of anything. But they still know in the deepest part of who they are that they're just scratching the surface of what it means to be and to live like Jesus. But they sure don't know how to get there. And as they look around at their peers, they are not sure they see too many other people living like that either. So maybe the dream that God placed within them is just an aspiration that has no value, at least except until we get to heaven. Breakthroughs happen. But in the midst of that kind of longing, the Holy Spirit says, no, it's no pipe dream. I put that inside of you for a purpose. And All Saints Lakeland begins to come alive in entirely wonderful and new ways, in a way that causes the community to take notice, the people who've been here for a long time, who've been praying for these breakthroughs, to begin to rejoice, and God moves and acts. That is the fruit of leadership and prayer that is willing to live out the I am second understanding of what it means to be a leader. The fruit of those kind of breakthroughs is that people love each other in whole new ways. There's a level of sacrificial care that flows through the life of the body. There's a level of prayer that begins to happen that results in miracles. There is an extraordinary level of vitality and life. And over all of it, it's just an extraordinary, breathtaking level of joy. People are just glad to be here and excited about what God is doing. And it's so clear, because no no, no one could engineer this, that God is on the move, and he is doing something new. What do I hope for All Saints Lakeland? Under the leadership of your new rector, breakthrough. Breakthrough that is, in fact, the fruit of a group of leaders, not just the rector, 
vestry, clergy, and other key people in the parish who are willing to say, who am I? I really am not in charge. I've got a lot of responsibilities, and I will live up to them to the best of my ability. But the real story is, I am second. And who the real shepherd of this church is, is Jesus himself. And we want him to take the lead. Because we know enough now to know that there is more than we could ever imagine. But only God, only God can make that happen. And so we seek his face. And we look forward to seeing what God will do. So read. If you will please stand. I hope you are not, and I trust that it is you are not, able to say lightly the I will with God's help to the charges that are being offered to you, but that instead enough inner breaking has happened in your life that you know that unless God comes through, even your best efforts will only take you to that idol called smooth operator and not to the place of spirit-empowered and humble servant that by the very character of what God is doing, continues to draw people, not really so much to you, but to Jesus. Because he's the chief shepherd. And out of that is raised up a congregation of people who with a kind of joyful level of relief can say, I'm not first. Thank God he is. I am second. So that the character and the life of this congregation, in this city, in this county, and in this community, would more and more reflect the life, passion, love, and vitality that we see in the Son of God. So that as people hear and come and visit and partake, they will say, God is in this place. And I am so glad. Amen.